Hi everyone, it's Neil here, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. This particular procedure has uh, got a lot of interest and anticipation. I uploaded some still images um, post-procedure of all the wax and uh, contents of the ear that I removed on Facebook the other day and I've had many, many requests to upload this video as soon as possible. In a moment you're going to see uh, a testimonial by the patient's wife who very kindly left uh, a little post on my Facebook page and um, so this gentleman contacted me last Friday um, in, in a lot of distress actually. Um, he was complaining, uh, his main complaint was actually oltalgia, so oltalgia is uh, the medical term for earache. Of course he was also experiencing reduced hearing. Um, on the phone he explained to me that he suffers from cauliflower ear. So for anyone who doesn't know uh, what cauliflower is, um, cauliflower ear in America actually I believe it's called wrestler's ear and it's trauma, uh, repeated trauma to the pinna. So the pinna is the external ear, the satellite dish. And post-trauma the cartilage of the pinna fills up with blood and that blood does need to be drained away by an ENT doctor as soon as it has occurred. If not, it can cause um, long-term complications and it can be quite serious. Um, and this repeated trauma just causes um, swelling of the external ear, which meant in this case the entrance of the ear canal itself is very narrow. Uh, the medical term for cauliflower ear is perichondral hematoma. In addition, he also advised that he um, has a mastoid cavity. So a mastoid cavity is an enlarged ear canal uh, for the reason that the posterior uh, part of the ear canal, the mastoid bone, which is porous, has been surgically uh, drilled and removed due to uh, an infection and that infection is called mastoiditis. So, in some cases, if you have a, an outer ear infection or a middle ear infection, that infection can get absorbed by the mastoid bone. And if that mastoid bone, if that infection is not treated either by antibiotics or if it's come to the stage where it needs to be surgically removed, if, it, if it's not, the mastoid bone obviously makes up part of the skull and um, it can cause to um, this infection spreading to the brain um, causing uh, meningitis possibly as well so it, it's very serious. Uh, in addition he also mentioned to me on the phone that he has got a long-standing perforation of the eardrum so perforation obviously the whole of the eardrum which meant that this patient can't use earwax drops uh, because if these drops do enter the middle ear through the perforation. Some of these drops are known to be ototoxic. So ototoxic drugs are those drugs that can cause permanent hearing loss. So in, in this particular client, those um, drops can enter the middle ear through the perforated eardrum and then get absorbed by the organ of hearing called the cochlea, causing permanent hearing loss. So it was a really a real challenge for a number of reasons. So again with cauliflower ear, not only is the ear canal entrance very narrow, it's also very stiff so it's not flexible, it's very difficult to retract this ear. Uh, previously you were seeing me uh, using a standard zolner suction probe and you can see this, this is not wax, it's uh, keratosis obturans which again is a, another feature of this case which makes it more complicated. Keratosis obturans is a build up of dead skin, what we call keratin. In most cases, um, you can compare the skin in the ear like uh, a snake skin. It sheds, it naturally migrates, and then you get another layer of skin. Uh, but with keratosis obturans, this skin, as it sheds, it doesn't migrate outwards, and it causes a dead plug of skin um, remaining in the ear. And it is one of the hardest things to remove. Uh, I should add, this video is not for uh, these armchair experts or those people who have got degrees, uh, YouTube degrees on earwax removal or Google degrees. This is a very highly complex procedure and um, sometimes this type of procedure is performed in a general anaesthetic. So um, I just wanted to point that out because I can imagine some of the viewers, oh why don't you use this instrument, why don't you use that instrument, like I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so yeah. Um, if you're one of those experts, please just turn away. You won't find this uh, video uh, of in any interest at all. 
Um, so the skin itself, you can tell it's skin, you can tell by the, uh, the complexion, you can see a lot of white, um, fresher skin actually. So I'm just using a, an ear hook here, and what I'm trying to do is loosen these skin adhesions from around the ear canal wall. Um, so here I'm just going to the roof of the ear canal, and this plug of skin, you can almost uh, describe it and cat uh, categorize it as uh, almost like a piece of chewing gum that's stuck in um, on, a, on a hard surface and it's dried up a bit but it's still a bit elastic so whenever you get an instrument like an ear hook through this plug of dead skin there's a lot of elasticity and I don't know whether it's visible uh, just by watching the video but when you're performing the procedure you feel the skin bouncing back it's a tug of war. This plug of skin does not want to come out of the ear. And also with this um, patient, um, as I said, he's got a very enlarged ear canal, probably three times the size of a normal ear canal. And you've, he's also got a very narrow entrance. So um, if you do the physics behind it, you're trying to remove a large plug of dead skin through a very narrow aperture. So it's very, very difficult indeed. So I, I, I've resorted to uh, the Henkel forceps here. I wasn't using crocodiles because with crocodile forceps, I find with soft, spongy dead skin, it just tears the skin um, and just releases little pieces, segments. So Henkel forceps um, have a larger surface area, so you do get a lot better grip. Um, so I did manage to get a bit out with the Henkel forceps, but I've just gone back in with the Zolna suction probe and you can just see how spongy this is and how adhered it is to the canal wall. And we're at the base of the ear canal here. And the other issue with um, keratosis obturans, so this client's already got an enlarged um, ear canal due to their mastoidectomy. <coughs> However, um, dead keratin itself can cause um, erosion of the canal wall, the bony part, so it's quite possible that this skin is actually, because uh, it's been in there for a long, long time, it has actually widened his ear canal even more. And I'm just, as you can see, I'm working at the back of the ear canal here. This is the mastoid region, and I'm really just trying to, as much as uh, I can really, trying to loosen this adhered, spongy skin off the canal wall, but it is a very, very difficult case. So um, I would really stretch this ear open as much as I can. And this is the back of the mastoid. Um, the, the, his original ear canal is way off to the right off screen at the moment. <clears throat> and I'm just trying to get in behind uh, using a Jobson horn and just elevate the skin, loosen it. You will find, uh, I'm not sure where it is in the video, but with this dead skin, when you do lift it off the canal wall, you do get what we call contact bleeding. So you can think about uh, if you've got a blister on your finger and you're peeling off this dead skin, you can sometimes get bleeding. Um, and it's purely due to um, the skin being stuck, adhered to the canal wall, and that compression. Imagine this big plug of dead skin in the ear and it's just growing and expanding and the amount of compression that's in this in this ear. And that was what's causing this gentleman's otalgia, his earache. Um, so I did manage to loosen some of this using the Jobson horn, but I've just gone back in uh, with the forceps. But even, even with the forceps, it's, it, even with the Henkel forceps, it was just tearing little pieces of um, dead skin away. This plug really did not want to leave and vacate this gentleman's ear. So I've just gone in with an ear hook and I've got a rather large piece there. Um, I'm just going to let you watch for a couple of minutes because it, it is a long video and obviously it's going to be a lot of talking my end but again I'm just going in with the ear hook here just trying to lift uh, this plug of skin um, from the base of the ear canal and I'm just on the posterior canal wall here in the mastoid cavity again just trying to elevate and retract this plug of skin from the canal wall and I'll just let you two watch that for a few minutes. Okay, so I just thought I'd come back and explain. So this part that I'm focusing on, there is a cave there, and there's a crater. Uh, so just in the middle of the screen right now, that's the client, you can see the cartilage, so that's the client's original ear canal wall. And to the left of it, where the, the suction probe is, that's the mastoid cavity. 
and it's difficult to see but there's a trench there and this plug of skin's right at the base and I'm just trying to gently lift this using the, um, the suction probe. I'm really tugging at that. You can see how spongy and elastic this skin is. And with dead keratin, it tends to coil. Um, you may be able to, and you get ribbons of dead skin, and um, on occasions you will be able to visualize that um, as I'm removing the skin and lifting it away from the posterior canal wall. You'll see these ribbons. Uh, people with mastoid cavities, and also people who suffer from keratosis obturans, um, they're normally um, evaluated at ENT outpatients on a regular basis because people with mastoid cavities they generally do develop keratosis obturans because that enlarged cavity doesn't lend well to the natural migration of skin uh, as the skin sheds in the ear canal. So, uh, but this client, um, I think the last time he was seen um, by an ENT was 17 years ago so this build-up has been there for around 17 years which is a, a long long time so um, at the end of the procedure, I did advise this patient to come a lot more regularly to see me uh, and we've agreed to see him in six months in the first instance and from then we can gorge how often he would need to come back. Um, it would be a lot easier if I was able to use some drops. So sodium bicarbonate drops works really, really well with dead skin but as I mentioned, this client has got a known uh, perforated eardrum so we're not, well, we want to avoid it wherever possible. Um, instilling any types of drops. I've just gone in with the Jobson horn and again I'm still working very hard at just lifting this um, plug of skin off the canal wall and you can start you can begin to see it loosen around the canal wall here you can just see the fresh layer there uh, in between the darker crustier skin in the middle and at the back there you can just see some contact bleeding so as I'm elevating and retracting this dead keratin from the canal wall because uh, it's so compressed you can see a bit of bleeding occurring there and just behind this plug of dead skin, the firmer skin, you'll see oh, very damp in here you can see it uh, it's very damp and moist and that can happen with dead skin it can eventually get very damp and wet and that is obviously extremely humid you can imagine it being completely blocked for uh, many a year and beyond the outer layer, the ear does become very damp and humid. So I'm just going in with the standards on the suction probe here, just to vacuum some of that dampness. And at the top there, you can see uh, a bit of bleeding there. Um, and so when we lift this epithelial layer of um, keratosis obturan off the canal wall, you do, it's what we call contact bleeding. It's nothing that we've done. We've not grazed the ear canal in any way or caused any trauma. It's quite common with cases of keratosis obturans. And if you, you can see the, the dead skin that's on the posterior canal wall, the back part, it almost looks like wax. It's, it's darker, but that's not wax, that's oxidized, which means that piece of skin, that keratin, uh, just to the left where the this, where this suction probe is, that has been in that ear for a long, long time. The other shades of dead skin, so the lighter brown, the white, it's all fresher skin. Now when I say fresh, it doesn't mean it's, uh, it's just been secreted in the last few days or weeks. It still could be in there for years, but it's um, what I'm making reference to. That darker piece of dead skin has been there for a lot longer than this lighter shade. And I've just there with this uh, suction probe, just trying to get a grip, really tugging at this. Um, and as I said before, it's like chewing gum in the ear. It's no better way of explaining it, and it's very elastic. And uh, it just, it's almost like a rubber band consistency. You're pulling the rubber band and someone's holding it on the other end and it just doesn't want to let go. So I've gone in with the Jobson horn. I'm just trying to get in behind and um, separate this and just trying to get around this big plug and just almost uh, like a spade, a, sh a shovel, L pull this out. So I've got a little piece there, just going to re-enter again.
one of the issues as well with dead keratin that's soft like this, whichever instrument you use, whether it's an ear hook or a Jobson horn or forceps, you kind of slice through it. Um, you're not getting big chunks out. You can see there that piece of dead keratin is very damp and soft. And as I mentioned before, uh, when you remove keratin, you do get some bleeding. So that was some of the keratin that we removed. And you can see, so this is the mastoid cavity. You can see the cartilage of his original ear canal wall just to the right. So this is his extension almost, his extended ear canal. And uh, it's just from that cave area. Um, you've got contact bleeding and um, this blood is just seeping out from the bottom which just kind of make the, the patient isn't in any pain whatsoever. Actually, he was enjoying the procedure because he felt as though every time I was removing a piece of keratin, it was um, re relie relieving the pressure in inside his ear. So he was actually cheering me on um, and um, praising me every time I got a piece of um, keratin out because he was finding piece by piece his symptoms were improving. And you will notice when, when the, the ear is a bit damp and there's a bit of blood, it does make the view a bit blurry. Uh, I can still see exactly what I'm doing, but um, it does cause a bit of blurriness. So on occasions I will come out and I use an alco wipe to wipe away and clean um, the distal end of the endoscope. And the distal end is the tip. It's the bit that we insert inside the ear um, to obtain the view. You can see that I'm really tugging away there um, at the Sort of dead skin plug and it's uh, I think I'm going to be going in in a moment with some forceps um, just to see if I can get a grip and retract this and extract it from the ear but it's still very tough in there so I'm just working on his original ear canal here this is the original this is the front part of his ear canal and to the left is his mastoid cavity but this is, if you didn't have the mastoid cavity, this, this area here would be his original ear canal. And you can see at the top, um, beyond this piece of skin, it was a bit damp and wet. And that's that, um, because of the humidity. Um, and over time, this dead skin can get infected. So um, I've just gone in with the forceps. I managed to remove a piece there. But it kind of teared it away. It didn't remove it in a big piece. So I'm just going back in there. Um, you can just see it's just with people often say why don't you use forceps to remove it but with this consistency um, it just tears it it's quite damp and soft and elastic it, if it was a solid hard piece of um, keratin or wax yes you can get a grip and just pull it out you can see how wet it is here so I've just got three small pieces there and I could I could tell it was a bit damp so we're just approaching his eardrum there and um, if you remember, uh, the patient did alert me that he has got a perforated eardrum. So again, we're just going to be cautious, careful here, because we, we can't see the eardrum, but we know the eardrum's behind this piece of keratin that's quite medial now. Um, you can, this almost looks like a normal procedure at the moment, um, because it just looks like it's a normal ear canal, but as you can see on the left-hand side, he's got a much widened ear canal, and you can see all that kind of fluid, damp, moist skin, all that fluid that's collected because of the humidity behind that skin, it's just seeping out there. So he didn't have an active ear infection of his eardrum. The, 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 the eardrum itself was dry and you'll see that uh, in a moment or in a few minutes. That wasn't infected. This is this moisture. It's just due to um, sweat and humidity and the dead skin that's becoming uh, kind of almost slightly infected itself. See, we're still pulling away there. And the reason for me having little intervals and not talking throughout the procedure, this procedure is about an hour long, it's, and it's, um, yeah, it can be very difficult to talk um, for an hour. So I'm just going to, at key moments, I will kind of interject and kind of just narrate over it. And you can see here how much, pr how much pressure I'm putting, how much I'm tugging this, trying to release this from the back part of the ear canal. I'm making some progress there.
So as ever with an endoscope, we've got a wonderful view. And that's one of the benefits of an endoscope. You have a wide field of view. Um, if you were using an ENT operating microscope or some head uh, magnification loops, you, you wouldn't obtain this view. You wouldn't be seeing the whole ear canal. You'll see a small section of the ear canal itself. Um, and that's because with um, microscopes, although you can get a very magnified view, the field of view is very narrow. So um, the specialist would be using a speculum. Um, and they'll put that in the ear and they'll be positioning the speculum around, trying to see um, different parts of the ear. So with a microscope and a head loops, you'll get, it's almost like jigsaw pieces, you'll get little jigsaw pieces and you have to put it together to get the big picture. Uh, and you get that by moving uh, the microscope around. Uh, one of the great things about the endoscope is that you just get the whole view in one, in one, in one pan panoramic image. Um, and that's the beauty of an endoscope, and that's why it's being widely used now within ENT as well. Endoscopic ear surgery is dramatically and exponentially on the rise. Um, as, as with most things, uh, when we first launched um, endoscopic ear wax removal in the UK, um, the old school, the old guard, uh, were very defensive. Um, I think also because I was quite young as well when I launched this, uh, there may have been a bit of uh, people kind of thinking, well, well, we don't want him to do well um, and um, it's been five years now since we've launched this in the UK and uh, we, we've trained a number of um, specialists, GPs, ENT specialists, audiologists, hearing care specialists, ENT nurses, um, not only in the UK but we, we've had a few people come from America, um, Canada, South Africa, uh, Australia and I think New Zealand so um, as with most things, it just takes a while for people to appreciate actually this has many, many benefits and not just turn your nose up at something because it's new and novel and maybe because some people wouldn't be able to perform this procedure. Um, we do find a lot of people who have been using microscopes or head loops for uh, a long, long time, um, they tend to struggle at first um, and that's because their brain's used to doing it in a certain way. Um, um, but over time, the majority of, and I wouldn't say everyone, but the majority, for sure, of specialists who were previously performing microscopic or head loop um, earwax removal and have come on our course, they have now tended to use the endoscope a lot more than the other two techniques. And there was a paper, a clinical study, I think in 2006, conducted by an ENT surgeon called uh, Mr. Pottier, who sadly passed away last year. Um, and he compared um, endoscopic versus microscopic earwax removal uh, in a clinical randomized um, trial. And he found, and his team found, that um, endoscopic earwax removal was quicker, more comfortable, and less difficult for the specialist to perform and there were significant findings and um, however um, in the UK most uh, ENT specialists um, already have an operating microscope so there's very little logic for them to revert to an endoscope but in the last decade or so uh, you're finding that a lot of audiologists like myself uh, ENT nurses have also performed the procedure uh, and another benefit of an endoscope is that it's portable so a lot of um, nurses or um, even audiologists and hearing aid dispensers they do offer domiciliary visits um, you can't really cart an ENT operating microscope at the back of your car it weighs, it weighs a, a ton uh, extremely heavy and with with our technique the eye clear scope uh, we've developed a little carrier case very portable very easy to use a small uh, blueprint so you can see us making uh, slow but steady progress and with these procedures it, it is patience, patience is a virtue, there's no shortcut, I wish there was, um, I don't enjoy spending an hour removing wax from the patients here, uh, I can sure tell you my hand is at my arm because it is extremely um, fatigued and tired after this procedure, but there's no other way, um, as I said can't use drops, it's got keratosis obturans which is the hardest thing to remove from a patient's ear, Quite often these procedures are performed under general anaesthetic by an ENT consultant. 
uh, it's got a mastoid cavity, it's got cauliflower ear, so the ear canal is very, very narrow, so it couldn't get more complex, I wouldn't have thought really. Um, all the elements were against me, um, but as I said, if you've got, with ear vacuum, you do need a lot of patience. Um, quite often I read all these comments on YouTube, why don't you just vacuum it? Well, well if it was that easy, we could train a monkey to do it. It's, I don't think people appreciate um, how complex ear wax removal can be. Uh, it's not a case of just putting a vacuum cleaner in the ear and sucking everything out or hooking it out. And I bet most of these people who make these comments wouldn't be able to get the instrument in the ear or both instruments in the ear. So it is, it is a complex procedure. So I've just gone in back with the Jobson horn, but you can see it was a lot of uh, kind of fluid at the base, a lot of bleeding there. Uh, Client again, complete um, comfort, not experiencing any pain. Obviously, if he was, we wouldn't have continued. Um, but it was, it was again, he was cheering me on here. I remember this particular point because this is where he was experiencing his ortalgia. And as I was lifting this keratin off the canal wall, he was feeling that release of pressure and that compression. It was getting um, bearable for him. And he was really willing me on here. I, can, I specifically remember this point because this is the part where he found um, it was causing him extreme discomfort when he attended. But it's so difficult. Um, he's got a big crater below there, and the skin plug, it's just literally a deer. So um, I thought it's a good idea at this time. If uh, this is the first time you're watching one of my videos on YouTube, please do subscribe. Um, I have over 150 videos. I have different playlists available of different types of procedure. Um, I think my YouTube channel now is, is approaching 140 million views. So um, yeah, please do subscribe. Um, you can also click the bell icon that will notify you as and when I upload new videos. Um, probably don't upload as many videos as I should it's just because I'm very busy and uh, these videos do take time uh, I, I generally am fully booked most days and um, again I'm just staying behind after clinic um, because of the pressure applied upon me from all my Facebook um, followers uh, who are really um, encouraging me to upload this video as soon as possible and um, if you're watching this on Facebook again Please do like the page, follow the page, uh, leave a comment. Um, that also goes to YouTube. Feel free to like and comment on the video um, and share and forward this video on. Sorry, I've not edited this part. Uh, I just probably missed it. So I was just going in with the ear hook there, got a piece of keratin out. So if this is a normal ear canal, uh, we would have finished by now because the amount of wax uh, or not wax, sorry, dead coating I've removed so far. It's an incredible amount, and you'll, you'll, you'll see that at the end of the procedure. I've got all the still images. Um, so it's almost like I'm doing four ears in one go. Um, and you, this is a piece of this hard keratin, this keratin that's been in there for a while. It's oxidized, and it looks like wax, but it's not. And I managed to remove some of that by using the ear hook. And again, apologies, I didn't edit this. I must have just missed this bit out. So uh, when I'm out of the ear, it's um, I'm just either cleaning the instrument, uh, wiping um, the tip of the endoscope, or either myself or the client just wanted a little break. Um, you can just see me there wiping uh, the distal end with an alcohol wipe just to make the view clearer. Um, hopefully this is the only part where I've, uh, I have forgotten to edit. And I think... The rest of the video I have edited out all the black um, black segments I do apologize for that so again uh, I'm just trying to remove another layer of this keratin uh, from that crater that cave um, on the mastoid area of the ear canal Can see how much I'm tugging this. I'm really, really am tugging this. I'm going backwards and forwards, trying to loosen this keratin. And there's a slither of keratin here that I managed to remove using a suction probe. So you can see kind of the halfway house. You can see on the right hand side that's his original ear canal. And on the left, uh, this is his mastoid cavity. And I'm just working on the mastoid cavity, just trying to release, it's still working away. So I have removed quite a lot already. Um, 
and again I'm just really tugging this and you can see it is loosening a bit now I'm getting a bit of purchase there and you can see this plug of dead keratin just kind of moving backwards and forwards up and down left to right I'm probably going to go in with the forceps in a moment um, as I've loosened this a bit and I've created a little tail end so there's something for me to grip onto. Let's see if I've gone in with the forceps. Yeah, there we are. So again, I'm just trying to get a grip and you'll see here how much I am pulling at this but it just doesn't want to come. It's just tearing into little pieces. I've got a better grip here, but again, it just doesn't want to come out. It's stuck here, as I said, it's like a piece of chewing gum. Um, just see that plug now it's beginning to loosen I think I've got well it just sliced again and that's why with forceps quite often people say well why didn't you why didn't you just use forceps straight away but again I'm sorry for the the blackout it's just I forgot to edit this bit it was a long long video um, I'm just scrolling downwards and that should be the last bit that I forgot to edit and I do apologize but yeah Forceps, again, it's not as simple as just putting some forceps in the air, gripping something and pulling it. There's resistance there. Um, uh, the consistency of that dead plug skin, it's wet, it's damp, it's just tearing off into little pieces. Um, you can see how damp it is there. It's just fogged up the screen a bit, so you can see all that moisture. So again, I'm just trying to loosen it with the vacuum again, with the suction. Um, just trying to bring it a bit forwards and as I do I will then kind of alternate between the range of ENT micro instruments so the most common is the suction probe which is what I'm using at the moment and this is the Zollner suction probe we do have a fine end attachment that we can add to the top uh, the fine end is less suction power but it, uh, it's less noisy so it's less and it's less atraumatic for the patient if we become in contact with the canal wall or eardrum we generally use the fine end for deeper wax and wax that's impacted on the eardrum. You've got a Jobson horn, uh, which is almost like an ear scoop. A Jobson horn is to remove soft wax. An ear hook, similarly, uh, is to remove uh, wax, but hard wax. And forceps is generally to remove, again, firm, hard or foreign bodies from the ear canal. So they're, they're the kind of four or five main ENT micro instruments we use. Just wiping the tip of the endoscope there, and again, I do apologise for this blackout. So I've just gone in with the ear hook, and you can see at the top there is a bit of an opening there. And I'm just trying to get the ear hook behind that plug of dead skin, and just to kind of extract this keratin. So I'm just going right behind the plug of skin, and you can see how damp it is. It's just slicing through like a hot knife through butter almost but again um, we got a bit out so slow but st steady progress just gone in this suction probe to remove that segment of soft dead skin so this is the original ear canal wall uh, this is his original ear canal and you can see we almost cleared this and uh, there's a piece of keratin here that I'm using a Suction to remove, um, that should come out in a moment, hopefully. And that should reveal his perforated eardrum. And the problem with uh, this type of consistency of keratin, it can often block um, the suction probe. So uh, I think on several occasions I had to, uh, the suction probe got blocked, I had to remove it from the ear and use a cleaning rod. So we have like a cleaning rod which we push through the suction probe to clear any debris that's got clogged inside. So we're working near the eardrum there, another piece of keratin and this part of the ear is Coming a lot easier now, so we're very probably about three centimeters into the ear canal. 
you just see how wet and damp that is and this is a large piece of keratin that I removed just mopping up near the entrance and you can just see the perforated eardrum there uh, when I vacuum this it should reveal itself just see his eardrum just to the where I am now behind that that's um, his eardrum and on the right hand side and it is very difficult to see because the patient has had surgery but there is a perforation there to the right um, I'm just zooming in there I hope that was visible it is difficult as I said uh, patients had a lot of surgery to his ear so he's got an abnormal shaped ear canal but I hope that was visible that perforated eardrum so his original part of the ear canal is completely um, cleared now that took me about 30 minutes to do, uh, about half an hour um, and now we're working on his mastoid cavity again so again it's just a lot of the same uh, apologize well I don't apologize if anyone finds it boring this is the reality of what I do um, as I said we're not it's not as simple as some people believe it is or sometimes I probably make out that it is used uh, on my videos I'm just using the Henkel forceps again just to remove this keratin that piece of keratin is a bit firmer a bit crustier and blends very well to forceps because you can get a good grip but softer uh, keratin spongier keratin um, it's not as effective because it just tears it it just cuts it and shreds it so just using a standard zone suction probe here and you'll see again I'm going to be switching between instruments so uh, using this, the suction probe to bring this a bit forward get a, a leaning edge a tail and I'll probably go in with some forceps just to grip on that because the top part of this is a bit firmer you can see that the base of this keratin plug is wet but the top part is a bit crustier so if I can get a grip onto that which I'm not sure if I managed to now it's just slicing there but I will persevere. Oh, yeah, no, I managed to get a big piece there. Another piece of keratin. So you'd be quite amazed at the end of the video when I show you all the still images. Um, so you can see there, that's the, the, the medial part of his mastoid cavity, very deep in the ear. So that's all clear now. So this plug that we're working on now is just as you enter. Um, his ear canal it's on the left hand side right near the entrance you can almost say it's behind the, the door so you, can, you open the door behind the door it's hiding away it's a bit of a blind spot but with the endoscope again uh, we just get such an amazing view um, of his mastoid cavity so we can see it and there's his perforation to the right um, had a little glimpse there there we are again you can see that on the right hand side just in view And if, you, if you're continuing to watch this video, this remaining piece of keratin doesn't look a lot, does it, on, on camera? But you'd be, you'd be quite amazed and shocked when I actually eventually remove it, just how much there was. Because again, you, this client's got a cave at the base of the mastoid cavity, and it's a large trench, and there was a hell of a lot of keratin there, a huge piece. see just how much I'm tugging there at the top and just trying to peel this keratin away and I remember um, it took me about five or ten minutes to really loosen this but really trying to bring that forward just as I'm bringing it forward it, it's like a, a, a trap door it kind of slams back Just using the Jobson horn, just trying to get in behind this, but the entrance of his ear canal, because of the cauliflower ear, it is it's very difficult to extract and uh, retract it, because that cauliflower ear, so or also known as a restless ear or perichondrial hemato hematoma, um, it does make the cartilage almost like bone, it's very stiff, so it's very difficult kind of stretching this ear open trying to get the instrument in behind and you can see again uh, very damp in there so whenever you you 
you lift some of this dead keratin off the canal wall, it just oozes all this fluid or this dampness that's present because of the dead skin. I'm sorry if any of you are having lunch or your tea or breakfast if you're in a different part of the world. It's not uh, the nicest thing to accompany yourself when you're sitting down to eat. Um, I suspect some of you may have clocked off by now thinking well this is a, a bit too long to watch but um, I know there's a lot of people who subscribe and watch that will be watching this right to the end because I think they appreciate uh, uh, what I'm doing here and how complex it is. Uh, of course some people may be pausing it and returning to this a bit later because um, I can almost turn this into a movie couldn't I uh, given its length of the procedure. Just see how, how much force I'm trying to apply here. But it's just like a rubber band, you, you're stretching it, bringing it forward, and it, as soon as you kind of lose a suction grip, it just bounces back. I mean, it was quite plausible at this stage just to end the procedure. Because um, the client symptoms more or less had resolved because that compression, all that, you can see there's, there's hardly any compression now because the rest of the ear canal is, is clear, it's open. But it's so important to remove this, I felt. Um, he was here and um, obviously he's not had this mastoid cleaned up for I think 17 years. So we had him on a chair and I thought, and I, and I did purposely book him in um, the last one of the day because just by him explaining his condition of the phone I knew it was going to be complicated and I didn't want to run over and keep my subsequent clients um, waiting. So again just using some handcuff forceps managed to remove a piece there and you can s it did shred off and I've just got another piece but unfortunately it's shredding a bit but I think I managed to get no it just shredded there I was hoping that big plug came out in one go. Nonetheless, although I'm shredding it, um, that is still removing it, so it just means I have just have to keep going back and taking little segments out. It's not ideal, it's a bit time consuming, but as I said, patience is a virtue. just see there how it's just sprung back. I got a grip and it literally um, just sprung back. And again you can see some contact bleeding. It's, we've not done anything there. We've not kind of cut into the ear canal. It's just as the skin elevates. In a way it's a reassuring sign for me because it means that I have loosened some more skin off the canal wall. Hence the bleeding. see it used has gone slightly dark and misty it's just because of that fluid so as well as the the bleeding when you do manage to um, elevate and retract some skin of the canal wall it just uses that fluid that moistness uh, that's present and it can smear the screen again but as you can see I can see everything I'm doing um, it's not affecting my ability to perform the procedure at all So that's 45 minutes so far, so we're in the last quarter now, I think there's another 15 minutes to go. Um, and again, I'll just let you kind of continue watching. I'm sorry again, it seems like I forgot to edit this, this part of the video, it's just me going out the ear.
and just some advice to anyone who does suffer from keratosis of Turan's uh, and also uh, a mastoid cavity do have your ears regularly checked it's very very important uh, you don't want to get allow your ears to get to this stage um, so do, do have your ears checked regularly um, if you don't have a mastoid cavity and you just suffer from keratosis of Turan's regularly instill sodium bicarbonate earwax drops sodium bicarbonate works really really well with dead skin uh, much better than olive oil olive oil is my first port of call for earwax but not so much for keratin i find um, sodium bicarbonate works exceptionally well obviously if you have a perforation you shouldn't be using drops um, just some regular ear care advice as well say so, um, I mean, I don't really have a substantial buildup of wax, but I still use olive oil um, spray, actually, which is designed for earwax. It's not your home extra virgin um, olive oil. Um, I know over centuries uh, people have been using that type of oil, but you do have specially treated, chemically treated uh, oil now available over the counter, specifically for earwax, um, which is kind of designed for the ear. It's a medical device, so it's purified, it's safe to use in the ear. And um, I, I instill drops every two weeks, uh, put it in one ear at a time, so uh, put it in one ear, I tilt my head so the ear that the drops are in is tilting uh, and facing towards the ceiling, I let it penetrate for five minutes, I then come back the other way and allow these drops to drain, that's important, let these drops kind of come out of your ear, if not, it will just soften wax and the wax will drizzle further down towards your, ear, towards your eardrum, um, so you just put a tissue underneath. And you can do the opposite ear the following night. Um, if you do the opposite ear immediately afterwards, when it comes to draining the second ear, some of the oil in the first ear will kind of re-enter the, the ear and drizzle further down. So one ear per night, uh, once a month, I do it every two weeks. And the concept is, is that you're trying to rinse your ear out using olive oil drops because you can't rinse your ear using water. Water is bad for the ear. It's a big no-no. Water in the ear can um, cause otitis externa, uh, an uh, outer ear infection. Olive oil and sodium bicarbonate drops are uh, a lot safer to use. It's not to say that you can't develop infections using those drops, particularly sodium bicarbonate, because that has got a bit of water in. And it's slightly alkaline, whereas the ear is slightly acidic, um, and olive oil is slightly acidic. Um, and the concept is prevention is better than cure. Um, use the drops regularly to rinse out any small pieces of wax and soften it before it kind of builds up. And the oil itself will help lubricate the ear canal wall. So it provides some natural lubrication to help the natural migration of wax. So wax migrates out of the ear in the following way. So the skin that coats the ear canal, uh, near the entrance in particular, has sebaceous and ceremonious glands. These glands secrete wax and um, some of the compounds of earwax, and as they mix, it forms earwax. These glands are typically only found in the outer third of the ear canal. And as the skin sheds, as I said, the skin sheds like a snake skin, this wax naturally expels, it migrates outwards, and then you have another layer of skin underneath growing and shedding and again that fresh layer of skin will secrete more wax um, and oil in the ear can help the natural migration of that skin and therefore the wax so just going back to the video so i've just about managed to get this plug out from the, that trench that crater uh, in his mastoid cavity on the left hand side and you can see how big it is and um you would believe you would think this is it once i've got this out that is all that's in the ear left but you'll be um, surprised to to learn that once i've got this out there is another big plug of wax i believe or not wax dead skin you can see how white this is it's all fresh keratin and i'm just using a suction probe just trying to loosen the ends off wriggling it forwards remember this plug of skin is much much larger probably four or five times larger then the client's ear canal entrance. And also it's important to remember this patient, um, he attended with ear aches, so he was already in massive amount of pain um, as he attended, and we weren't using any anaesthetic, any no local, no general. 
and you can just imagine how well he tolerated this procedure. You can see how hard we're working in here and how long we've spent in there and all this kind of tugging and pulling and lifting of skin of the canal wall and again he was really cheering me on um, just begging me almost to continue and just finish it finish the job off for him I've got another 10 minutes left I forgot I had a zoom meeting at seven o'clock um, with my clear wax um, colleagues uh, I'm just going to continue editing this video and I'll Apologise to them for joining late. Um, I spent 50 minutes <laughs> already narrating, so I'm not going to stop now. Just hopefully, it's only I think less than 10 minutes to go. And again, you can just see this this plug of skin is near the entrance of his ear canal. We're just trying to pull this through. See just how much of a tug of war this is, just trying to squeeze this through his narrowed ear canal. So I'm just using the forceps again, just trying to extract this plug, but the problem with forceps, as I said, sometimes it just shreds this keratin, but in this instance, I've managed to hopefully get this plug out. Yeah, it's a big, big piece there. <coughs> just going back in to get the tail end of that plug. Um, let's see, let's do a bit more. So the forceps weren't really cutting the mustard there. It was just shredding it and actually pushing it back in. So I've just gone back in with the suction probe, just trying to bring it to the entrance of the ear. And again, it's a, it's a combo of instruments we're using. So bringing it to the entrance and um, I think I might go back in with the forceps. Once it's at the entrance, I can grip it and pull it. And with this piece of keratin I may have managed just to vacuum it out because it's a bit softer and um, it's a bit more pliable. No, using the forceps again just to pull that through but again it just sliced it into a smaller piece. So gone with the jobs on the horn, um, just trying to get in behind that plug and there we are, I've managed to get some of it through the ear canal. It's quite damp, quite moist. There we are, so you can see, you probably saw how much force I was applying there to get this through. And as I said, this piece of plug is about four times larger than the entrance. So it, although it is spongy and stuffed, it still requires a lot of penetration and force to get behind it and kind of bring it forwards. Uh, that's where the jobs on all helped. Just going to mop up near the entrance there with the suction probe and another piece of keratin. So it's almost like a, a magic trick with a magician has a handkerchief underneath uh, their sleeve and they pulling it continuously pulling this handkerchief um, handkerchief upon handkerchief and it's like similarly with this ear it's a never-ending ear you keep pulling this skin out and out and just as you think there's no more skin there's another piece you can just imagine um, how um, fatigued my hands were at this stage but um, I'm still able to get a very steady view um, so I'm holding the eye clear scope, the endoscope with my left hand and the instrument I'm holding in my right hand. 
So there's a bit of bleeding there, but it's a bit of keratin as well. So just want to suction that through. I think the patient joked as well. Obviously, patient's never been in labour himself, but he, he did say um, he imagines what um, this would be com uh, comparable to giving birth as every time he was having these plugs removed from his ear, he was just finding so much relief. So uh, it wasn't a nice sensation for the patient, but it was coping very well indeed. And just going, trying to get in behind using the Jobson horn again, but fortunately it just pushed that back in a bit. So I'm probably gonna have to go in with a suction probe again and bring this forwards because it's a bit deep. So I'm just going to bring this forwards again. And you can see it's quite, you get a reflection, so keratin's white. When we have light shining from the endoscope on a white surface, you do get reflection. Uh, and that's why it's so bright at the moment because uh, it's like with any uh, object. So white objects reflect light more than dark objects and that keratin was so white it was causing a glare. Still struggling to get this last piece of keratin out of the ear. Um, but as I said, perseverance, patience is a virtue. And you can see that movement I'm using with the suction probe. I'm just wriggling, going round in circles, trying to squeeze this out of the ear canal entrance. Just trying to get a different angle there to see if it helps. So I've just gone to the base inferiorly, trying to lift this plug upwards. Do you remember he's got that that trench, that cave? So just trying to lift it upwards so this the base of this plug can kind of be released. And I've just gone a bit deeper in with the suction pro, trying to get a bit of a suction grip on a bigger piece of the plug, and there we are. A big piece. I think there's still some more in there, believe it or not. Yeah. Another huge piece. And all this um, was hidden away. It was all hidden away in that trench, that cave, uh, in the mastoid cavity. Uh, if, you, if you remember what I said earlier, you'd be quite, I said, I, you'd be quite surprised because when we, when I removed all the debris and uh, keratin from the original part of the ear canal, when you were visualising what was left, the remnants, it didn't appear like a lot. But I, I did mention at that time, you'd be surprised later on in the video how much, just how much there was. Again, it's just gone a bit blurry. So, um I'm just really tugging away at this. There's a few cilia, a few hairs at the entrance. People often say, why don't you cut them, why don't you trim them? Well, I don't, don't really need to, it's not affecting me. Um, with, with any procedure, you only do a procedure if it uh, provides clinical benefit. And for the, okay, it may not make best viewing, but I'm not making these videos for the sole pleasure of people watching it. Um, I'm doing it to help a patient and it's a clinical procedure. So there's absolutely no need in, in this case anyway, to remove those hairs. Again, just this last plug of keratin. Just trying to rotate this keratin, just trying to reposition it. You can see I'm just lifting it forward from the from that kind of crate to that base. Just turning it to see if it... it it's almost like when you're um, trying to move 
a sofa from one room to another. And you Hi guys, sorry if the sound cut out there. Uh, the software that I'm using just timed me out. Um, the narration is uh, only allowed to be for a certain time, so it kind of paused me and asked me to save that and start recording again. So, sorry if there's a little um, brief moment of silence there. Yeah, and I was saying before, so uh, sometimes with wax or keratin, you have to reposition it. So it's, it's like when you're moving a piece of furniture from one room to the other, you just have to get it in that right angle, because obviously that sofa or bed is larger than the door frame, and you have to get it in the right angle to kind of allow it to be maneuvered through the door into the other room. Just using an ear hook now, just trying to get in behind this plug of keratin, which I have. I think this is probably the largest piece of them all. side so bit of keratin still there you can see um, there's not a lot there though now I've got the majority of out and this is that cave that trench I was talking to you about it's a lot more visible now um, and this keratin this spongy skin it's you can see how spongy and elastic it is when you vacuum it, it just bounces back it doesn't want to come out um, You can see all that white coating so I'm going to remove the majority of this we're nearing the end of the video and um, you'll see at the end of the video I had to stop um, it's just because the patient was getting a bit dizzy he was experiencing the caloric effect so when we vacuum the ear people can often uh, experience a bit of vertigo and that's because um, the vestibular system the balance organs located in the inner ear and cool air which is what um, the suction probe introduces into the ear can inhibit the balance organ and remember we've got two balance organs um, so the balance organ in this particular ear is being in inhibited so it's, it's kind of being almost suppressed and the opposite balance organ is functioning fine so the brain's getting mixed messages from both ears and so therefore it believes that you're moving but you're not and then people suffer from vertigo because your eyes then try and correct your ears and your brain, telling your brain that you're not moving, it's just your ears playing a trick on you. Um, and that can happen either if you introduce a cooling effect in the ear or a, a, a warming effect in the ears if you increase the temperature, it's called the caloric effect. And near the end he did get a bit of faint, short lasting, but nonetheless so it, the procedure was long enough as it was, um, uh, we've done our job. Just show again, just trying to remove a bit more keratin of, of this crater. You can see it there. We're not trying to remove every single last bit. Um, this procedure's gone on quite a long time already. Just some bleeding blood there, just vacuuming that. So that's that cave, that crater caused by his mastoid surgery um, and there's the eardrum to the right you can see it's a bit damp in there again um, so that dead skin it is still a bit oozing a bit of fluid it's not coming from the perforation it's just a dead keratin and this is a final view so there is a bit of keratin left here and there but you can see how well we've done we've really removed that it's perforation visible there uh, and as the patient's wife um, at the beginning of the video stated, the patient's now a human being, he's back in the land of living. So this is the, some of the still images, you can see just how much uh, we removed, uh, you can see all the instruments there we removed, we used, we used um, suction probe, Henkel forceps, ear hook, St. Bart's ear hook, a fine end, we went through the whole repertoire of instruments there. Um, and that's it guys, I hope you enjoyed that, um, uh, I hope it wasn't too boring for some of you watching um, and hopefully I'll upload some videos um, shortly. Take care, bye!